Hello. On this edition of MTA Commuter Connections, we'll introduce you to a new transit system being planned for suburban Maryland in Montgomery County. We've got information on a commuter tax credit program that just might make a difference in your commuting. We'll take a look at Maryland Minority Business Enterprise and an observance of Black History Month, a look at what's new at the Reginald F. Lewis Museum. You've also got your customer questions and concerns in our Ask the MTA segment right here. I'm Paulette Ostrich. Welcome to MTA Commuter Connections. You've heard about Central Maryland's proposed red line for Baltimore and the purple line for Prince George's and Montgomery counties. But there's another system being proposed for the region, this one also in suburban Maryland in Montgomery County. It's called the Corridor Cities Transitway, or CCT. Joining us now with more on this exciting project is Rick Kegel, Cities Transitway Project Manager. Welcome, Rick. Thank you very much. Very nice to see you. you too. Well, this is an exciting project. Um, tell us a little bit about the CCT. What is it? The CCT is actually an acronym for the Corridor Cities Transitway. Uh, it's a bus rapid transit system that's going to be operating in Montgomery County. Um, you might think of it as very similar to a light rail system, except instead of the light rail vehicles running on tracks, you'll have buses running on a dedicated roadway on an exclusive right of way. Wow. And, and where will it run? It'll run uh, in Montgomery County from the Shady Grove Metro Station through Rockville, Gaithersburg, up to the MTA Mark Metropolitan Grove Station. And why is this particular transitway necessary? The county has been actually for uh, the last 20 years pushing development into this area. They had, they had put the Quarter Cities Transitway in its master plans um, back in the 1990s and started encouraging development to grow around these future stations. So now this development is in place, um, we're moving forward on the transit system. That's great. And how much will it cost? It'll cost, uh, our last estimate uh, is in 2012 dollars, which means that the last time we did the estimate was in 2012. Um, and at that point, the first segment, a nine mile corridor segment of the total 15 mile segment is around $545 million. And how will it be paid for? Uh, there are a variety of, of sources to pay for the system, including the federal government, uh, the State Transportation Trust Fund. Mm -hmm. We also anticipate county uh, involvement as well as private developers. Is there a federal approval process required for this? There is. There is. Um, anytime you ask for federal money, you have to follow a federal process. There are really two programs that uh, we're aware of uh, that need to be followed. First is the New Starts process, which is really the application process for getting funding for transit projects. Uh, and then secondly, again, for any federal project where you're asking for federal money, you have to follow a federal environmental policy uh, uh, process. So we have to prepare environmental documents and get the federal government to sign off and approve those. Right, those guidelines are key. Yes. And how many riders will it carry? Um, we anticipate by the year 2035, which is our forecast year, uh, that we'll have 35,900 daily boardings. Wow. And, and will this connect to existing transit services? It will. It, it will connect uh, at the Metropolitan Grove Mark Station uh, with the Mark system that runs on the Brunswick line there. Um, and then we'll also, the other end will be at the Shady Grove Metro Station. So anyone riding the CCT, uh, if they're coming from the north, they could come down on the mark and get to the local businesses by transferring to the CCT. Or if you live in the corridor itself, you can get on the CCT and go to the Shady Grove Metro Station. Fantastic. And what kind of vehicles would you use? Uh, the system is currently planned to operate bus rapid transit vehicles. These are 60-foot articulated buses. not too different from the buses you see on the street today, but, but have a much more sleek appearance, similar to the light rail vehicles. They'll feel different, they'll look different. Um, they'll have multiple door boardings, like light rail and like uh, the metro system, uh, where the fare collection will be done on the platform itself, and then when the vehicle pulls up to the station, multiple doors will open, you'll have level boarding right onto the vehicle, doors will close, and the vehicle will be on its way again. Oh, wow, that'll save plenty of time. Yes, exactly. Can you talk to me a little bit about these community area advisory committees that are being formed? In yes, uh, we're in the process right now of, of organizing three area advisory committees. Uh, they will serve three different geographic regions along the corridor. Um, we hope that with these groups of local residents and business owners, 
uh, that we will be able to, to communicate with them as to our plans and they can communicate to us as to their concerns and then together we can try to find a solution that will be a win-win for everyone. Fantastic. How can people get more information about this? Uh, they can contact us at uh, the Maryland Transit Administration. We also have a project website. Um, it's www.mta.maryland. Dot gov slash CCT. Uh, on that website, we try to keep it as up to date as possible. There's contact information there as well. It's a lot of background information on the project. Fantastic, Rick. That's great. Thanks so much for joining us. You're I look welcome. forward to Thank hearing you. more about CCT. Coming up next, we've got information on a commuter tax program that just might save you a few dollars in commuting costs. That's next. The region is often listed as one of the most difficult places in the U.S. to commute by car. The wasted time, wasted gas, and added wear and tear to your vehicle adds up to a significant toll on you and your pocket. Transit is always the better option. There's actually a program you and your employer should know about that provides an incentive and a tax savings for transit riding. It's the Maryland Commuter Tax Credit Program. MTA Senior Marketing Specialist Buddy Alves joins us with information on this. How are you, Buddy? I'm doing well. It's great to see you. I'm, I'm so glad to have you here so we can talk about this program because it's My very pleasure. interesting. Very yes. interesting, and I'm going to be taking notes. Okay. Explain the MTA Commuter Tax Credit Program. What is it? Well, it's, um, it really is an incentive that was designed to encourage employers to provide transit, uh, um, TDM, we call it Transportation Demand Management, uh, programming. It could be carpooling, van pooling, it could be uh, transit, a uh, number of things. Uh, if they provide these elements under TDM, then they would be eligible to receive a 50% credit on the amount of benefit they're providing to their employees as a tax credit from the state of Maryland. Well, wow, that sounds fantastic. What um, transit modes or systems are used in conjunction with the tax credit program? The transit systems that are involved are um, any in the state of Maryland that, that operate. It doesn't make any difference. It could be uh, the metro system in Washington that comes into Maryland. It could be any of our systems. It could be any of the uh, lots systems, the locally operated transit systems. If uh, they provide money to them to get tickets to provide to the employees, then they would be eligible. Um, is, interestingly enough, we have more employers from the Silver Spring, Rockville, Bethesda area taking advantage of this than we do in Baltimore. How did the program come to be and, and how long has it been around? Back in 1999, an uh, advocacy law firm in Annapolis called Cleaver and somebody else, I can't remember who, mm -hmm. but it was a law firm there. They approached me and said, can you help us draft legislation to change Maryland tax law to allow for a tax credit for certain expenditures? The idea being, as I said earlier, that the employer would be so motivated to set up some kind of alternative transportation plan at the work site that um, he would say, hey, it won't cost me much. I'll go ahead and do that. And I'll give you an example of, of how good the savings could be. Let's say an employer chose to give a $64 monthly pass. That's our mm -hmm. core service pass here in Baltimore. So you can ride on a local bus, light rail, metro, subway. For providing that $64, they would get a federal and a state tax deduction as a regular business expense against the amount of benefit that they provided. In addition to that, the state of Maryland will give them a 50% tax credit on that $64. In other words, they would get $32 back as a credit every, for every employee every month throughout the course of the tax year. It would reduce the cost of that pass to $11. Oh my gosh. It's incredible. That is, that's incredible. Um, how can people get more information about this program? Well, we have a number of ways. There is a brochure available uh, that's got a cute little piggy bank on the front cover 
that's on the Maryland Commuter Tax Credit explains every detail of it. They can go on the www.commuterchoicemaryland.com website and learn all about it. And they can go on the mta.maryland.gov website and learn all about it. That's terrific. Yeah. Well, I'm going to have to have you back because there's oh. a lot more to talk to about this, this program. Yes. It's very exciting. Thank you, buddy. My pleasure. Just ahead, we've got information about state government business opportunities that may be of interest to small and minority businesses. Stay with us. As you might imagine, a state like Maryland is a substantial consumer of goods and services of all kinds. This need for items and services presents small businesses in the state, especially minority businesses, important and valuable contract opportunities with Maryland government. But as a business, you've got to be certified to participate in the process. Joining me with information on the certification process and the Maryland's Minority Business Enterprise Program is Allison Tavik, Director of Communications for the Governor's Office of Minority Affairs. Allison, it's great to see you again. Good morning. Thanks for having me here. Well, thanks for being here. What is the overall mission of the Governor's Office of Minority Affairs? Um, I would describe our mission of, as one of trying to fight discrimination against small and minority owned businesses that want to do contracting with the state of government or the state of Maryland. So those that want to get into the public arena. This is a cabinet level agency which speaks to the governor's dedication to reaching out to people from all over the state. Tell us a little bit about the governor's dedication to addressing minority concerns. Well, I think the uh, MBE program has been a top priority for the O'Malley-Brown administration since day one. And under the leadership of our secretary, Zanita Wickham-Hurley, the program's really making progress. So there are changes to policies, things that are being done to strengthen the program and make it more accessible for small businesses. What role specifically does the Governor's Office of Minority Affairs play in MBE initiatives? Well, there are really four things that GOMA is responsible for. Um, we assist in setting policy. We are also the compliance arm for the 70 agencies that are part of the Minority Business Enterprise Program. We are involved in helping small businesses learn how to navigate that procurement roadway, um, which can be a big chore in and of itself. And then we are also serving as the primary advocate for all small and minority and women-owned businesses. That's great. What a wonderful resource. For viewers that may not know, what exactly is Minority Business Enterprise, MBE? Well, the MBE program um, was established in 1978, and the program itself, again, is, is in place to combat discrimination. In Maryland, we have an overall reaching goal of 29%. So our goal says that we would like to see all state agencies uh, spending 29% of their uh, expenditures with small minority and women-owned businesses. And the firms that are part of the program specifically need to be certified in order to participate. So the firms are uh, vetted through the system, and that is done with the Office of Minority Business Enterprise. They are a arm of the Department of Transportation. The process takes about 90 days for a firm to go all the way through the certification process. Um, it's a bit labor intensive mm -hmm. and paperwork intensive, but it's not anything that a small business couldn't complete very easily. It in many ways can be similar to completing a loan package, the degree of information that's being asked. Um, I would say the number one thing, uh, when you look at this type of an application, it can be somewhat intimidating to a small business. So it's very important for business owners to understand that um, the not every question is going to apply to them and it's okay to not have an answer for every block in the application. Uh, our colleagues at the Office of Minority Business Enterprise offer a seminar the first Tuesday of every month where they help applicants take a really in-depth examination of what the application is all about and um, how to go through it very confidently so that you can go into the process with, uh, with a lot of uh, success. And who qualifies for MBE status and, and um, what's the uh, process for becoming certified? 
When a, a firm gets certified, seeks certification because it believes that it is socially and economically disadvantaged, there are five core eligibility standards that every firm has to meet, and it's not a situation where they can just meet several of the eligibility standards. They must meet all five. So the five standards are built around the minority status of the firm, which would the owner must be um, a woman, mm -hmm. African American, Asian American, Native American, or Hispanic American. Okay. All right. So, in addition to that, uh, that minority status, it's the percentage of ownership mm -hmm. and the control of the minority owners in the firm. The personal net worth of those owners is also evaluated and then the business overall has to meet a size standard that identifies that they are in fact a small business. Okay. Um, how can viewers get additional information on Maryland's MBE and we didn't touch on it too much but the Small Business Reserve Program I know is another one of your programs. How can they get the information, what kind of resources? Well, there right? are so many resources available to small business owners, and um, I have to say our website has a lot of them out there. So I would encourage viewers to go out to www.goma.maryland.gov. There's a great explanation of both the Minority Business Enterprise and the Small Business Reserve Program, as well as how to make connections with those programs and tap into the resources that are going to get them to figure out if these programs will benefit their business. There's also a tremendous resource section with information on everything from financing programs to skills development programs um, and outreach events that help connect small businesses to the agencies and to the community that wants to help them grow and prosper. Great, Allison. Thank you so much. And I have to attest their website is fantastic. It's a great resource. The dedicated staff of the MTA Transit Information Center at 410-539-5000 field thousands of calls each day from transit patrons all over the state who call to request information about one or more MTA services. Perhaps a call center agent has assisted you with information related to your commute. Commuter Connections recently paid this group a visit for a behind-the-scenes look at their customer service efforts. We appreciate your call. My name is Evelyn Dales Davis. I'm an information service operator. I'm also a trainer. And you're going to get off at the Lutherville station. Uh, my name is Daryl Clark. I'm a call center technician slash information coordinator. My duties vary from being an information service contact operator to a lead person to a trainer. My primary job is to maintain and update MTA's automated telephone system and I also take calls as an agent here in the call center. It's just been an overall joy of, for 41 years being with MTA. When I first got here I was given a schedule book and a map. We just gave out simple bus schedule information. I didn't even know this department existed. Every call is different. Um, you have to be malleable where you have to kind of morph into their kind of attitude. Sometimes you'll get a very happy caller that just wants to talk and sometimes you get angry callers so you have to be able to combat that also kind of bring them down off that cliff. The demand for service is what people want and people are trying to get from point A to point B in a timely manner. They're just wanting to do what they want to do and get where they're going. Now the best part of this job is the customers actually. I love speaking to the customers. I've always liked the family members here. It's still important to be able to do the job and get the customer where the customer wants to go to produce proper service for the people because without them, we wouldn't exist. MTA is a great place to work. There's so much opportunity to, um, to move up and uh, get a better position. And there's a lot of um, opportunity for education also. I work directly with the customer and I can get them the information that they need immediately. Good morning, Transit Information. This is Daryl. Therefore, I am the MTA. Thanks to the dedicated employees of the Transit Information Center who assist and serve our transit patrons each and every day. Coming up next, a look at what's new at the Reginald F. Lewis Museum of African American History. Stay with us. Maryland is so rich in history, especially African American history. And with this being February and Black History Month, we can think of no better place to visit or feature this month than the Reginald F. Lewis Museum. It's a place the entire family will enjoy. Here with a look at what's new at the Lewis Museum is its Director of Marketing, Helen Newen. 
Helen, how are you? I'm fine. Good to see you. Thanks. Who is Reginald F. Lewis? He is a Baltimore native, and he was America's first African-American billionaire. Um, so after graduating Harvard Law, um, he made his fortune through founding his own law firm and then went on to head um, TLC Beatrice. Wow. And how long has the museum existed? It was founded in 2005, so we're coming up on our 10-year anniversary. Wow. And for those that may not be familiar, where is it located? We're right in the Inner Harbor, um, a couple of blocks from the National Aquarium, so um, come on by. We're at the intersection of President and Pratt, and we have a parking garage right across the street, so it's really easy to get to and come and visit. Great location, great location. Um, how did the museum come to be? Before Reginald F. Lewis passed, um, he did have a dream. He was a great philanthropist, and he had a dream to become a, and found a, a a museum dedicated to African American culture and history. So he made a very generous gift, um, and with the collaboration of Maryland State, uh, the museum was founded in wow. 2005. That's fantastic. And how many exhibits or displays are, are part of the museum's presentation currently? Yeah, well, we have uh, two, a couple of galleries, and uh, also I should mention our yummy museum cafe serving soul food. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, and spaces also uh, where we provide art workshops for kids and families, and spaces also where we um, have musical performances and films and living history for class uh, school groups um, and members of the public. Wow. Now you probably get asked this a lot. What's your most popular exhibit? Well, right now we have the Kinsey Collection, um, and it's an astounding private collection that includes an early copy of the Emancipation Proclamation, mm. a signed copy of Brown versus Board of Education, and works from the Harlem Renaissance. And it is one family's private collection that um, they have generously loaned to us. And we're so lucky to be one of three museums in the country that is hosting the exhibition. Um, it's on view through the end of Black History Month, so come check it out. Oh, fantastic. And aside from that exhibit, what else might visitors expect to see this month, which is Black History Month? Yeah, um, well, we've got a range of programming, um, whether you're a teenager or um, a kid or a family or someone who just is a mad history buff. <laughs> um, we have a couple of author talks, one on the history of Soul Train, oh. America's favorite dance wow. show. Yeah, and one that looks at the Underground Railroad as well, um, and a film. And we actually have the Kinsey family coming back in early February, too, to give a personal lecture on the Kinsey collection. Um, in terms of kids and families, lots of stuff going on. Um, we kick it off with a youth film and culture festival uh, that showcases works by teenagers um, who have created works dealing with issues in their lives. And we're also showcasing um, work from high schoolers all across Maryland who are part of our juried art show. So um, that's, that's again, great. yeah, through uh, the end of the month. Um, look out also for our normal third Thursday performance where the museum is open late. We have Gabrielle Goodman. She's a songstress who has toured with Mary J. Blige, Patti LaBelle. <laughs> it's wow. going to be a fun month. That's great. Now, how long do exhibits generally stay on display? Um, it depends. Um, the Kinsey Collection is on view through the end of um, through the end of this month, and our next exhibit will be up for um, several months. So anywhere from three to nine months or more. Okay. Yeah. And something I've always wanted to know: How do the ideas for the exhibits come to be? Yeah. Well, they are uh, different ways. Really, we have a director of collections and exhibitions, um, and she. Um, receives ideas from all over and sometimes there are collaborations such as our high school juried art show. Uh, it is um, done jointly with the Maryland State Department of Education. Um, so uh, just different, 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 ways. different ways. How does the museum receive its funding? 
Through a variety of sources, we are um, a state-supported uh, uh, institution, but of course also corporations, foundations, and individuals play a huge role. So um, our memberships, our loyal members help support the museum, and so we are always encouraging people when they come and visit, or even if they're not able to come and visit, to offer their support to the museum to preserve and showcase the contributions of African Americans. And how can uh, individuals or groups help support the museum or contribute financially? Well, we have lots of different ways to get involved. Um, we're always looking for volunteers, and in terms of membership, um, whether you're a student, we have student memberships, we have family memberships, as well as individuals. So um, I would visit our website or call the museum uh, for more information. And speaking of the, uh, the website, I was just going to ask, how can people get more information about the Reginald F. Lewis Museum? Visit www.rflewismuseum.org. Next, we'll answer your customer questions and concerns in our Ask the MTA segment. Stay with us. Welcome back. MTA Systems Engineering's Tammy Bolden joins us with a few MTA customer questions and concerns. Hi, Tammy. How are you? Hi, I'm fine. How are you? Good. What do you have for us today? I have three great questions from our customers related to bus transportation. And the first question is? Why don't we have transportation earlier and later on Sunday? Because it's an inconvenience on Sunday and a hassle getting to and from work. Actually, yes, it is possible to provide bus transportation earlier and later on Sundays. However, the demand for ridership is not that great during those earlier and late hours. The MTA has to make sure that there's enough ridership to justify the cost in order to provide that additional service. Next question. I was just wondering why there isn't a bus route in New Newtown yet, because every day I got to get off the bus here and walk home, which is about a two and a half mile walk. That is a great question. Several years ago, there was bus service going towards Painters Mill and the T. Rowe Price building located by Lakeside Boulevard. However, the service was discontinued because of the poor ridership. Now, if you fast forward to the present, the Newtown area has been heavily populated and it's been building up quite a bit over the last couple of years. So your question will be sent over to our service and planning department and will be a part of our bus network improvement program. Final question. I wonder why we have to sit on the bus waiting for a late replacement driver. I have to apologize to you in advance because it is never MTA's intention to inconvenience nor delay our customers at any time. However, our operators are trained to continue on if and when their relief is not available at their scheduled time. Now, if you would like to ask the MTA any questions, please, we would love to hear from you. Drop us a question on Facebook, on Twitter, or at our MTA website. Well, Tammy, thanks so much for being here. It was great seeing you. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thanks, you. those were great questions. Well, that brings us to the end of another Commuter Connections program. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Take care.